the Chair of the Committee on Human Services. Today is Thursday, September 22nd, 2022, and we are hearing, holding this hearing using the Zoom platform online. The time is 10.01 a.m. And we are holding this hearing, this virtual public roundtable, to receive testimony regarding the district's Community Services Block Grant Program, or CSBG. The CSBG provides funds to alleviate the causes and conditions of poverty in the district. In accordance with the Federal Community Services Block Grant Act, the committee is meeting to receive comment on the district's plan for CSBG activities. The committee will hear from the Department of Human Services who administers the CSBG, as well as the United Planning Organization, or UPO, in its capacity as a community action agency. The CSBG brings in millions of dollars to district communities in every ward and supports thousands of district families. It's the foundation of home purchasing programs, early childhood development centers, workforce development efforts, grandparent fostering programs, and critical community development initiatives. Without this grant and the diligent stewardship it demands, the district would lose an invaluable asset in our work to lift residents out of poverty and create a viable pathway to financial security. I look forward to hearing from our public witnesses from UPO and from the Department of Human Services about the district's efforts to do so. Just some logistical announcements for today's hearing. In addition to Zoom, this hearing is being broadcast both live on my website at briannekenado.com slash live, and for the first time on YouTube. I would also like to provide some detailed reminders about the Zoom platform and the committee's protocols for the witnesses participating today. All witnesses participating in the webinar are currently listed as attendees in Zoom. That means your microphones are muted and your video cameras are turned off. When it's your turn to join a, a panel for testimony, I'll call your name and a member of my staff will invite you to join the panel. You'll need to activate your video by clicking on the button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen that looks like a video camera and please remain muted until it is your turn to testify. Um, there will be a frame that includes a clock keeping your time. Representatives of organizations will be allowed five minutes to testify and public witnesses representing themselves will be allowed a total of three minutes. When your time is up, I kindly ask that you conclude your remarks so that we can ensure that everyone has a chance to be heard. Um, we will have one panel of public witnesses, and then we will go on to UPO and then to the Department of Human Services. In order to enhance accessibility, this hearing will have the closed captions functions enabled. And if you'd like to turn on this function, please click the closed caption logo located on the bottom right of your Zoom application. For any technical difficulties, you can message our host labeled as Committee on Human Services. And if you're having trouble gaining access to the Zoom and you have pre-registered, you can reach my team at 202-834-8091. I will now turn to our first and only panel of public witnesses. All right, um, Maria Teresa McPhail. President and CEO, Vita Senior Centers. Leticia Durkins, Senior Manager, Early Childhood Direct Services, Venom Family Foundation. Joe Wilson, Program Manager, Workforce, Edgewood Brookland Family Support Collaborative. Nate, Sharice McNatt, Yuse Lancaster. We will be moving these folks to the panel now. Ms. McDowell, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Madame Brian Ledoux, SCSBG committee, and to the whole committee of the human services, Dr. Andrea Thomas from UPO. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. My name is Maria McPhail. I am the president and CEO of PIDA Senior Centers. It is a great honor to be here today representing Vida Senior Centers 
an organization that has been serving the seniors community for more than 52 years. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of UPO, a longtime founder and partner for VIDA. VIDA Senior Center's mission is maintaining and providing the quality of life of seniors. VIDA is the oldest nonprofit organization serving Hispanic communities and other low-income seniors in the greater DC area, filling the gap for multiple social determinants of health. VIDA's clients are predominantly older women who are living at or under below the DC poverty line while struggling to age in place. VIDA is a multicultural and multilingual organization predominantly Spanish and English, serving around 1,000 seniors across the city. We provide services across the eight wards of the city with physical presence and two of them, which is Ward 1 and, four, and Ward 4. The seniors be that serve have no way to increase their incomes as their average age is over 75 years old. UPO has utilized the Community Service Block Grant to provide constant support for them as they age in place. With the help of CSBG funds from UPO, BIDA provides a holistic support in healthcare, housing, security, creation and recreation and socialization and other life affirming services for the elderly in the city. CSBG positioned UPO to have a salient impact on increasing the healthcare services while decreasing the healthcare cost and other age-related uh, expenses for the seniors we're serving. For more than 22 years, UPO CSBG funding has been a pillar in VIDA services to decrease causes and condition of poverty for the low-income seniors. With this funding, we cover 40% of the VIDA Senior Center's programs to deliver at least Four hundred to services to at least to uh, around four hundred sixty-nine seniors in the city. Services has adult education programs, health and social behavioral development, mental health, nutrition, and other services which support multiple domains. All needs of the senior served find themselves living below the two hundred percent of the federal poverty line. Annually, Bida utilizes the CSBG award to deliver an average of 40,000 services units, including the food commodity program, which delivers more than 18,520 food packages to 360 seniors. It was the pandemic that made the commodity food program especially relevant and important in UPO use the CSBG funds to join effort with BIDA to support the DC seniors. The service we provide currently do not come close to the needs of the seniors we served. And we believe that continued and additional CSBG support will assist to serve even more seniors on the demand of higher than we are serving now. Thank you so much for having us. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here talking about the amazing support that UPO has given to BIDA for decades. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, I do not see Latisha Durkins. So we will continue with Joe Wilson. When you're ready, you may turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Joe, are you at your computer? Okay, let's go on to Nate McNatt. Nate, are you ready to testify? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. I cannot see you, but it looks like your camera's on. Is there something going on with your lens there? Sorry, give me one second. Okay, oh. there we go. Hello. Bump it up a little so I can see your face. There you go. Okay. Is that good? Yeah, great. Good morning, everyone. I am testifying 
behalf of UPO, um, I would like to start by saying being a part of the UPO and the Workforce Development Program is the perfect life-changing experience. My mentor referred me to UPO where I met Mr. Kenneth Carroll and Mr. Richard Cochran. When I joined the Professional Building Maintenance Program, I became very intrigued about learning more detail about facilities maintenance. Sorry, my mom has been taking care of our household for about 20 years now, and the knowledge that I received from UPO will help me assist with my career and helping her take care of our household. UPO has changed my view on DC's community for the better, and I have gained more confidence about my own life, many others, and many in my community. I know that I can do anything when I put my mind to it, and when I joined UPO, I felt like I would fold under any pressure that I thought of or pursued. I now can adapt to many situ situations, whether I'm comfortable or not, and I am motivated and dedicated more than ever to achieve goals that I have set out to accomplish for a long time. I have gained more self-discipline, and I am committed to always hold myself to high standards and accountability for my actions. During my 12 weeks at UPO, I met plenty of guidance advisors encouraging me to help me to the path of my success. Ms. Mallory is my career development instructor and she has prepared me to be more comfortable with public speaking, interviews, and perfecting my resume. Mr. Davis and Ms. Ms. Annie collectively prepared me for many job searches and encouraged me to extend my love of helping my community. Whether I'm on the job or in the natural world, I have the confidence to pursue whether I need to finish each task. Ms. Ola and Mr. G kept me motivated when I was discouraged about finding childcare for my one-year-old daughter. And I'm grateful that they were, at, they were there to help me join the UPO's early learning program. And I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the UPO family. I believe more people in our DC community should be notified about UPO's knowledge, resources, and movement. More people deserve a second chance the UPO provides. UPO has made it possible for me to be self-sufficient and helps me reaffirm my life and purpose in other people's. Without the UPO Workforce Development Program, I would not be on the road to success. The funding that UPO receives is making it possible for me and so many others to complete each task and training that we come about. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for your testimony. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. We'll now go back to Letitia Durkin. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Would you like to turn on your camera? It is it is on on my end, but I don't see the button on the bottom. I just see the mute, um, the mic. Hmm. Well, um, I don't know how to fix that. So why don't you just go ahead? And okay. I also sent an email. Okay. I also sent an email to the email that I got to join to see if they can advise me. If you want, you can move me down, or I can just do it without the camera. Whatever works. Um, let me see if we have a way of troubleshooting that. Oh, I see. So um, what happened was we sent you an invitation to join as a panelist. Um, and I keep clicking on it and then nothing happened. Oh, okay. So, um, and so what they did was because that wasn't going through, they just unmuted you. So I think we're just going to have to carry on. So <laughs> this is, this is what we got. Um, so please go ahead. We want to hear what you have to say. Okay, no worries. Good morning. Um, uh oh. One second.
Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yep, okay. we can hear you just fine. Hello, good morning, Chairman Brianne Nadu and fellow Human Services Committee members. My name is Leticia Jerkins, and I am the Senior Manager of Early Childhood Direct Services at the Bainham Family Foundation. The Bainham Family Foundation is a philanthropic organization that has invested in the well-being of children and families in the D.C. area for more than five decades. The foundation works with community-based organizations and strives to build an equitable, equitable society that supports all children and families, especially those who have been systemically excluded from power, resources, and opportunity because of poverty and systemic racism. On behalf of the Bainham Family Foundation, I am pleased to testify in support of the United Planning Organization, known as UPO, a community action agency and annual recipient of the Community Services Block Grant. As the designated community action agency for the District of Columbia, UPO has served city residents since 1962 and has been a premier model of excellence among the district's early Head Start programs. UPL has also been a trusted foundation partner for more than seven years. They have been active in numerous citywide strategies to improve early care and education for infants and toddlers and their families. On behalf of the foundation, I can attest that UPL has been a reliable and trustworthy partner. They have continued to steward the resources we provide annually for early learning services to District of Columbia residents. UPO has supported early learning and the well being of young children and families living in marginalized communities, served as a technical assistance hub for smaller childcare centers and homes, provided subject matter expertise to guide the foundation's work and investments advocated for the equitable distribution of resources for young children, early, edu early childhood educators and families, and implemented innovative strategies to better serve young children and families. The Bainham Family Foundation is highly supported, supportive of the continuation of UPO being a recipient of the Community Services Block Grant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your testimony. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, let's try again with uh, Joe Wilson. Joe, are you with us? Can you unmute and try your camera? Okay. Well, then we'll go on to um, Jose Lancaster. Good morning. Good morning. My name is actually pronounced Wise. 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 Thank yeah. you. Wow. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Like I said, my name is Wise Lancaster. Um, I was a student in the Community Services Block Grant funded UPO broadband telecommunications training program. Um, I truly enjoy being in this program and I learned a lot. It gave me lifelong skills and helped me find a route to a career. Um, before I graduated, uh, I knew I didn't want to go to college, but knew I needed to have a plan. I couldn't afford to just stay at home doing nothing, and I didn't want a regular job. I learned about UPO through the Saturday program. I met Mr. Kenny Carroll. He told me I could do more over the summer. Um, I was interested, and I decided to sign up. I initially wanted to do electrical, but since there wasn't a teacher at the time, he told me to think about telecommunications. I came in one day and met Mr. G, and he told me about the broadband telecommunications training. He showed me what I would be doing, what I would gain, and answered my questions. I liked what he told me and knew it could be a great start for me. I'm glad I made a decision to go through with it. Now that I'm done, I'm looking for work and I'm ready to start. I'm very grateful to Mr. G, my case manager, and every other instructor who helped me throughout these 12 weeks. I was given a huge opportunity and I won't let it go to waste. Thank you, 
Thank you, Wes. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. Um, okay. <clears throat> so unless Joe Wilson is here. I'm here. Ah! Yay! Okay. <laughs> are you able to turn on your camera? Yes. There you are. Okay, just in time. Yes. All Thank right. You. Go ahead when you're ready. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, my name is Joe Wilson. I am the Workforce uh, Development Program Manager for the Rise Up Program, which stands for Readiness Individual Support Employment Program. And we're at Edgewood Brooklyn Family Support Collaborative. I'm here today to testify regarding the opportunities for get vocational training and employment because of, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the community-based community service block grant designed to empower low-income families and individuals, uh, re revitalize low communities and improve economic self-sufficiency for low-income customers by addressing causes of, of poverty. EB EBFSC is a community-based organization, nonprofit, uh, by the mission of strengthening families and to build vibrant communities in Washington, D.C. EBFSC has been serving families and individuals since 1996 and offers an array of family strengthening, such as housing, stabilization, school base, and workforce development programs. In support of this mission, EBFSC began partnering with United Planning Organization, the Designated Communities Action, I'm sorry, did it, <coughs> excuse me, Designated Community Action Agency for District of Columbia uh, in FY 2009 to address poverty, promote economic security, and well being through the Rise Up program. EBFSC offers case management services, vocational training, and certification, job search, skills training, placement, retention, and entrepreneurship opportunities for our, our program participants. EBFSC is currently serving 70 participants in the program. However, I would like to highlight two of the individuals who lit, whose lives have, <coughs> excuse me, families were impacted by our program. Let's start off with Ms. S. Ms. S and her two children were homeless and were living in the shelter system. She was assigned to EBFSC's Family Housing Stabilization Program, which is called FRSP Program, who like her to, who linked her, I'm sorry, to the Rise Up Program for assistance in finding employment and training so that she could achieve housing, stability, and afford the necessities for her family. Her employment specialist met with met with her three times each week, helping her to conquer her barriers that, was face, that she was facing. With partnering up with, I'm sorry, with partnering to update resumes and conduct mock interviews to increase, to increase confidence level, to increase her confidence level. A job interview at CVS was set up to hire her on the spot. She was extremely excited and grateful that she finally landed a job after being unemployed for years. Unfortunately, she was laid off due to the pandemic, but uh, we preserved. And um, in August of 22, she landed a position with SecTech as an SPO officer at American University, which offered her benefits after 90 days and employment. She was so excited that she finally was able to move forward and, and start saving so that her and her children can live comfortably without worries of keeping a roof over their heads and meeting, of course, their necessities. We will continue to work with her on this track uh, for employment and retention for the next year. I have one other individual and it doesn't look like I really have time to talk about that individual. so. I would like, in closing, to just thank uh, you for allowing us to support uh, at AB, <coughs> excuse me, the EBFSC to speak how the Community Block Grant at UPO has enabled EBFSC to provide critical services and support the District of Columbia residents. 
Thank you so much for your testimony and for your work in the community. Thank we you. It's really my place, so I apologize. Oh, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Have a good day. You too. Thank you so much. This will conclude testimony from our public witness from our uh, public witnesses, and we're going to move on to our organizational and government witnesses. So we are now joined by Tunde Aboda, the state CSBG administrator at DHS, and we are also joined by Andrea Thomas, president and CEO of the United Planning Organization. Before you begin your testimony, I will have you both turn on your cameras and raise your right hand and I will administer the oath. Perfect. Okay, Ms. Thomas. Okay, we got you both on the dough. Our board chair is also here, Jeffrey Page. Okay, will Jeffrey be giving testimony as well? Yes. Okay, then let's make sure we promote him and we do the oath for all three of you at once. Thank you. Absolutely, thanks for letting me know. Yeah, there he is. Do you wanna change your name, Mr. Page, on the display <laughs> or do you wanna stay as Andrea? Good morning. We can rename or I can rename it. Yeah. Do you know how to do it? Yep. Okay. We'll would let you do that. That way, when you talk, people know who you are, just in case they missed the intro. <coughs> Excuse me. There it is. I think we're square. All right, everybody raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Human Services is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Very good. Thank you. Ms. Thomas, you may begin your testimony. Um, and uh, and we'll move on to, do, does Mr. Page have his own testimony or just for questions? Yes, he has his own testimony. Would you like for him as the chair to go first or to that's up to you too. However you think it flows better. Mr. Page, I will defer to you. Um, it doesn't matter. You can go first. You're I'll fine. Do. Okay. Okay. Chairwoman Nadeau, committee members, officials, and colleagues, I am Andrea Thomas, president and CEO of the United Planning Organization. Thank you for the opportunity to present the work and impact of UPO during this legislative hearing. Today, I will share how the board of directors and staff implement and leverage the community services block grant to help residents achieve economic security so their communities can thrive. We look forward to your feedback and questions. UPO was created in 1962 to coordinate the long-term planning of human services needs and facilities. UPO became the district's community action agency in 1964 and our history shows that our work has and continues to make broad and deep impact. In 1964, UPO launched the first, one of the first pilot Head Start programs in the nation. And currently, UPO is the district's largest early Head Start provider. And as Mr. Page will note when he speaks, we are held up as a model for quality early education. We provide training and technical assistance to 15 other early learning providers in the city, ensuring that they deliver quality education and support to families. We also collaborate very closely with DCPS. And right now we operate early learning centers in five DCPS high schools. And we partner with Ketchum, Malcolm X, and soon Randall Elementary. In 1964, UPO provided free legal services to district residents and we created the Neighborhood Legal Services Program. Today, we work in, in partnership with Zedic DC and Washington Legal Clinic again, to continue providing needed services to Washington, D.C. in the legal space. In 1976, we were an early sponsor of the Foster Grandparents Program. And today, UPO provides 50 DCPS and charter schools with nearly 200 seniors who provide academic support to young people directly within the classroom setting 
or virtually. It enables teachers to maintain classroom management and keep the pace of the curriculum. In 79, UPO created the Community and Food Nutrition Program, which later became the Capital Area Food Bank. And today, UPO collaborates with CAFB to provide meals and groceries to over 400 seniors through the Grocery Plus program. Over the decades, UPO has continued to, to develop progressive strategies to create innovative, high quality programs that move residents into stable futures. And our work today is guided by six strategic goals. One, offering pathways to the middle class. Two, creating and growing social enterprises. Three, expanding our, pro our portfolio programs offered regionally. Four, develop and implement a coordinated and marketing and development approach to make sure we're reaching our audiences. Five, leverage government funding by 20% with private sector support to diversify our funding streams. Five, leverage, pardon me, and six, use the Baldrige model, Baldrige management practices of continuous improvement model uh, to cultivate efficiency and nimbleness in our business practices. These strategies support a pro-education, pro-career, and pro-community approach that helps address residents' basic needs, foster economic security, and actualizes community actions mandate to move people experiencing poverty to self-sufficiency. Pivotal to securing self-sufficiency is earning a living wage. A critical part of our customers achieving financial stability is job training and placement through our Workforce Institute. UPO's portfolio of national trainings are certified by the Office of the State Superintendent of Education. Our certifications for EMT, electrical, plumbing, cabling, CDL drivers, IT help desk, and culinary arts are all high demand fields, which ensures the residents are equipped to pursue long-term career pathways. In addition to UPO training, the agency also provides grant funding to other service providers for career training and placement. And in the past two years, we have collectively placed over a thousand people in jobs. And let me share two stories, if I may. Reggie T earned a national certification in broadband telecommunications at UPO and was so impressed by the training that he invited his son to do the same. They both are now certified and hoping to own, open their own business. Michael B came to us after 40 years in prison. He had grown from a boy into a man while incarcerated. We placed him at the, in a job at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He was promoted within six months and hopes to complete his career there. In addition to being pro-career, UPO was pro-education. As the district's largest early Head Start provider, UPO leverages CSBG to operate 17 early learning centers and recognizing that the first thousand days of a child's life are the most critical for forming a solid foundation for the rest of their lives, UPO was tapped in 2015 to serve as the main hub for the city's quality improvement network, which is a multi-year effort to boost outcomes for infants and toddlers. Nationally and locally, there is a dearth of early childhood teachers and UPO wanted to be part of the solution. To develop the local pool of passionate educators, we added a childhood development associate training component to our OSI approved certifications. Many of our early Head Start parents have taken advantage of this opportunity. They are earning certifications and we soon hope to see them as classroom teachers. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that in the early chaotic days of the pandemic, the district government called on UPO among others to quickly open up three emergency childcare centers for the children of first responders. We prepared classrooms for pandemic safety and opened in a matter of days. The Washington Post quoted Nicole Thrower, a mother and first responder who placed her son in one of our centers. And she said, and I quote, I appreciate the love and support from his teacher, the center director and the coach. They cater to him as if he were their own. And that is how we treat all of our young people. As our children continue to grow, we continue to support them in the educational environment. Our Youth Services Division has robust after-school activities for first to 12th graders that drive student academic success all the way through college. Our programs use hands-on project-based learning in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, otherwise known as STEAM. 
An example of our student success is seen through our robotics club that was in at Henley Elementary School. Students learned about engineering, problem solving, and teamwork. They worked hard to become the state champions in the DC VEX IQ Robotics League. And then they advanced to the Robotics World Championships. Our team was the only 100% African-American team among 400 competitors from 30 countries in all 50 states. Our POWER program, and POWER stands for Providing Opportunities with Educational Readiness, follows students from seventh through 12th grade and prepares them for college and careers, inspiring them to pursue 21st century careers in STEM. We have partnered with local universities, the Smithsonian Institute, the Anacostia Watershed Project, the National Society for Black Engineers, just to name a few. And this exposes our students to the possibilities open to them through science-focused enrichments. And this is coupled with targeted social-emotional supports to ensure that our students are able to live balanced lives both inside and outside of the classroom. And I'd like to share another anecdote one of our students, Justina, by her own admission, was an argumentative student who wouldn't listen to anyone. Her mother asked UPO to help her. Justina joined our multi-year college readiness program, matured, and now it is hard to identify any weaknesses because she is constantly turning them into strengths. In our social emotional learning workshops, she learned strategies to manage her emotions while staying focused on her goals. As a result, she graduated high school with a 3.5 GPA and earned nine college scholarships during her freshman year, and now is majoring in social work at Virginia State University, which was her dream come true. Our pro-career, pro-education efforts are intertwined and bolstered by our pro-community mission. It is no surprise to this body that one of the most pressing community needs is housing. Affordable, dignified housing is the foundation of stable communities and thriving families. Our experience in the pandemic and the work conducted during our community needs assessment reinforced how dire housing conditions are for many residents. And we found that the district's median rent rose over 44% over the past decade. We know from our work that housing affordability and housing quality challenges deeply affect UPO customers. But we are contributing to alleviating this in three ways. One, in rental assistance, UPO is part of the ERAP and CHAP delivery for the city, along with using CARES funding for rental support. We also support intensive case management through our permanent supportive housing, where we are now uh, providing support to 74 families and we are increasing that every year. And we're partnering with developers to deliver new affordable housing. In 2019, UPO became a direct provider of affordable housing in our partnership with developer TM Associates, a national provider of affordable housing. We built 76 new units at 1551st Street Southwest, uh, the first new uh, affordable housing in nearly two decades. And we are on tap to provide an additional 101 units and 56 units in Ward 7 in Northeast DC. All of these apartments are for residents who learn, who earn less than 50% of the area median income. But beyond housing, UPO understands that some supporting communities mean supporting their articulated goals and visions. Through our Advocacy Division and Community Leadership Academy, we are helping residents advocate for themselves and their communities. Our Leadership Academy graduates spearheaded the Ward 8 Health and Wellness Survey, presented it to the community, and are now following through with testimony to DC council members and are in talks with other stakeholders to make real challenges. They are also deeply involved with UPO's efforts in the Jobs Not Guns Project. This was established to support Mayor Bowser's Building Blocks DC initiative to reduce gun violence. Our graduates are helping to reach communities citywide about opportunities for more jobs and less violence. We partner with nearly 150 diverse organizations to expand our programmatic offerings. And right now we're collaborating with residents, businesses and stakeholders in three community impact zones, 
Brentwood in Ward 5, Buzzard Point in Ward 6, and Benning Terrace in Ward 7. We are collaborating with residents who are driving these place-based strategies to improve their communities and quality of life, and we look forward to expanding to even more in the future. UPO was also instrumental in the success of the high resident participation in the DC census. We were a trusted partner to get responses from residents in the hardest to reach communities. We worked hand in hand with the Bainham Family Foundation, the Greater Washington Urban League, ANC commissioners, and many others to spread the word about the fiscal and cultural importance of the census. UPO hosted information sessions, social media gatherings, and supported the DC Council media campaign to ensure that DC would receive its fair share of federal funds. UPO's partnerships help ex extend the work that UPO does and builds on the strengths of our organizations. Many of our grantees focus on training and employment, including uh, partners like DC Central Kitchen, Edgewood Brookland Family Collaborative we spoke today, Associated Catholic Charities, Metropolitan AFL-CIO, Thrive DC, and again, as you heard from Vita Senior Singers, all um, grantees of UPO. But serving the community over the past three years during the pandemic meant addressing deepening community needs. Of course, COVID affected the lives of our own staff and their families. Like the rest of the nation, UPO team members had to balance work and educating children at home, caring for loved ones and dealing with the physical and psychosocial challenges of, st of staying safe during a, a pandemic and in the midst of political unrest. It was their resilience, commitment and creativity that enabled us to continue serving district residents. And in some ways we wound up serving them better. When we made our parenting workshops virtual, attendance doubled. Now we offer both in-person and virtual activities for parents. We continue with our operation of the shelter hotline as part of the city's continue, continuum of care for the homeless. And we used it to increase food distribu distribution to people experiencing homelessness. We continue to issue EBT cards to customers eligible for the SNAP program so that 40,000 families can put food on the table. And we ensure that clients of our methadone clinic receive their daily medication so as not to exacerbate their health conditions that could have led to risky behaviors. As a recipient of the CARES Act funding during the pandemic, we took a two-pronged approach to addressing pandemic challenges. The first was to provide relief for emergency needs. And these actions included providing nearly 2,000 computers to students to support distance learning and distributions to seniors to prevent social isolation and encourage telehealth visits. We provided personal protective equipment to families, schools, and youth serving organizations Food insecurity was uh, a great need. And so we provided hot meals and delivered meals and grocery store gift certificates. And in some uh, instance, delivery of foods directly from the grocery stores to our families. And we provided COVID and vaccine education to the community. Rental and utility assistance was a dire concern for residents during the pandemic. And 518 residents were supported with aid in this area. And that was in addition to the ERAP and CHAP support. Families were assisted with COVID related medical bills, baby supplies, summer camp tuition, burial support, and mental health support. Our second area for the CARES Act funding was economic security. We expanded our job training and added new certifications that we projected to be in high demand post pandemic. Network security was added with the anticipation that many companies would remain in a hybrid posture and would need a workforce that could support their IT security needs. We launched an environmental cleaning and sanitation program, again, anticipating heightened cleaning needs. And we added an entrepreneurship component to this. So uh, any of those trainees who wanted to start a cleaning business could do so. For graduating high school students, and you heard from WISE, UPO launched a construction career series to introduce graduating seniors to post-secondary options in the construction trades. And this program was highlighted on NBC4. And over 2 million in community grants was set aside for other nonprofits to provide education, training, and other support to families during the pandemic. Recipients like the DC Diaper Bank, a wider circle, Spanish education centers, and others helped to expand the reach of CSBG dollars. 
We are proud of the work that UPO has done to use CSBG funds well, and we're planning for the future so that we can do more and continue to make impact. We will continue to establish our role as a provider of deeply affordable housing. We will launch our food truck as a training and entrepreneurship tool, as well as a social enterprise tool. And we are hopeful that three years from now, social enterprise will be a core part of our work. We will refine UPO's programs to align with regional long range career opportunities for customers. We will engage in legislative advocacy by, by amplifying the voices and needs of people with low incomes. <clears throat> UPO has created a new legislative advocacy, <clears throat> pardon me, advocacy department to invite customers and staff to tap into their experiences and use their voices to call for needed policy and budget changes for the poor. And we will develop non-clinical mental health supports for our customers. As we all know, poverty is stressful and stress and unrealized trauma affects the daily well-being of people experiencing poverty and their opportunities for advancement. UPO prides itself on being a teaching and training organization pursuing excellence. And that causes us to take public input seriously, to critique and constantly reassess the effectiveness of our work and create standards of accountability higher than those of our government funders or even private supporters. And so in closing, I'd like to end with this quote from US Senator Cory Booker, who was a guest speaker at our Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Breakfast. And he said, and I quote, thank you UPO for making hope blossom in the district and for helping to make a beloved community where we all have equal dignity and abundant potential, but also belong to each other. That is our goal, to contribute to making a beloved community where we all have equal dignity and abundant potential and belong to one another. And we will believe that we will do this as we continue our mission of uniting people with opportunities. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's quite a lot. So thank you. It's a good thing uh, that we have this uh, round table so that we can put all of this on the record. Um, it really is critical work. Thank you. All George. right, so Mr. Page, a tough act to follow, but. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairwoman Nadeau and the Committee on the Committee on Human Services. I'm Jeffrey Page and I serve as the UPO board, uh, the chair of the board of directors. I'm proud to, to present to you today on behalf of UP, uh, Washington DC's low income residents. UPO has been committed to breaking the cycle of poverty since 1962. As you are aware, UPO's mission is to unite people with opportunities. Our staff of over 400 helps 50, DC 58,000 DC, DC residents each year with a budget of $35 million. Our impact is felt in education, employment, health, housing, and advocacy. From my review of previous boards, uh, board chair's testimony and today's testimony, I'm going to make the assumption that you are familiar with the services we have provided since our founding. I want to use this time to highlight our, about, highlight our efforts during the pandemic, our partnerships, our board of governance, and the personal impacts we have had as an organization. To say the last two years was, unprecedented, was an unprecedented time is an understatement. When I took over the role as board chair and when Ms. Thomas assumed the presidency, we could not have imagined what was around the corner. UPO is a large organization, yet we proved to be nimble, responsive, and adaptable to our community's needs during the pandemic. The, de the decrease in child property rates made headlines recently due to the federal government's aggressive policy response to the pandemic and UPO was vital in administrating those allocated funds to the Washington, D.C. community. The pandemic confirmed that UPO is a trusted steward of funding resources and a place where people come together to serve during a crisis. I will now highlight our pandemic response. UPO was called on by the district to provide child care to first responders. Andre, Ms. Thomas talked about this earlier. We responded immediately to this urgent need and equipped three new centers to serve the children of these heroes in a safe and highly qualified learning environment. 
We use additional CSBG funding received through the CARES Act in multiple ways, including providing rent and utility support for 518 households using $3.9 million to help residents avoid utility disconnections and evictions as, more, as the evictions as moratoriums was lifted. This support was on top of the delivery of services through CHAP and the ER, ERAP grants. In addition, we funded youth servicing organizations each summer whose focus was to help quell the learning loss that was in effect that occurred during the pandemic. We also provided mental and physical health support to youth. As schools reopen, our foster grandparents, senior volunteers, senior volunteers supported over 5,000 children in classrooms by teaching them math, reading, motor skills, and social and emotional skills. During the pandemic, we gave laptops to both students and our volunteers, and we continue to provide literacy training to our foster grandparents and other senior citizens throughout the city. The UP UPO Workforce Institute, which opens doors to high demand careers from IT, from IT and education to electrical tech and healthcare helped a thousand people find jobs despite the pandemic. We also launched a youth construction training program that we that we will continue to improve. And you heard about that from a, a witness from the community as well as Ms. Thomas. UPO is committed to being a partner in developing 500 units of deeply affordable housing within five years. This is imperative and this is an issue that the city is facing now. And once again, UPO has proven to be uh, a strategic partner and, uh, and uh, responsive to addressing a real-time need in the city. We also continue to operate the largest early Head Start services for the city. And, and during the closing of our center, we reached out to our parents weekly to see how we can help them and how we could better provide services to, uh, to our clients. We launched virtual classrooms and social distance reading in parks. We continue to expand and adapt. We opened the Eagle and Malcolm X early learning centers during the pandemic and are on target to open more centers in partnership with the DC public schools. A critical component to our success in serving communities is our partnerships. We have formed partnerships with community orgs, nonprofits, businesses, universities, federal, and the DC government. For example, partner banks urged us to use already granted funds to help those facing housing insecurity. We've partnered with Martha's Table, Big Valley Produce and Capital Area Food Bank, among others, to distribute 133,000 meals to families, seniors, and people experiencing homelessness. We established new partners with uh, entities such as Nats for Good, the Metropolitan AME Church, BBNT Bank, and Brookfield Development to offer more pandemic response support. We also partnered with the George Washington University Medical School. Uh, students to deliver over 400 meals and groceries to senior citizens for several weeks. Scores of people in the communities we serve went door to door educating residents about the importance of the census. We've called senior citizens to stave off social isolation, and we have served hot food to those in need. To those in need. As board chair, it is important to me that UPL maintain steady governance. We moved to virtual recruitment and question and answer sessions about board participation. And when it was time to recruit new board members who were bring expertise to this, when it was time to recruit new board members who would bring expertise to this board. This, this, <clears throat> this led to the largest community voting the agency has had for our board elections. Accountability is another critical component to our success. According to the National Community Action Partnership, which is a membership organization for over 1,000 community action agencies across the country, the performance scorecard we developed is a sophisticated management tool that uses an agency-wide approach to show accountability for our report, for, for our results. The scorecard takes a weighted approach that analyzes several, several factors, including, but not limited to, the organization's ability to meet each of the 58 community action organizational standards, the organization's performance on its five-year strategic plan, 
the organization's financial oversight systems, and how well the organization is building operational compa capacity through staff training and improvements to service delivery models. These are just a few of the factors used in the scorecard. The last thing I want to talk about is the personal impact that we have on real people's lives. <clears throat> there are two individuals that I will highlight their stories. Um, and one actually is a direct uh, link to myself. Um, I've had, I bought a home in the district in 2015 and it's been, um, it was allegedly renovated, but <laughs> it ended up not being um, what I bought. And I've had to take my house apart piece by piece and rebuild it. And I have this electrician that I work with um, quite regularly. And one day he brought this young man with him. His name is Daquan. And he was serving as an apprentice to the electrician um, that I use. And I, you know, just striking up conversation with them. And he expressed his goals and what he wanted to do. And he said he wanted to be an electrician. He had also, at the time, he was a high school senior. So what I did was I took his information and I passed it along to UPL staff. And UPL staff immediately embraced the young man and put him in the program and gave him the support he needed. I still hear from him to this day. He texts me and he thanks me every time about what UPO has meant to him. And he's also, um, I believe, been able to serve as a, a real-time point of contact for us to spread the services we've provided. He has been uh, uh, not, you know, it's personal for me because he was actually in my house and but he's also been just a beacon for what we try to do and the, the people that we're trying to serve the next person i want to mention is a young lady named janae janae was living in her car when the pandemic arrived and she was laid off she turned to upl staff to sharpen her resume she said upl staff helped improve her writing school skills and and readied her for her unexpected career change she saw an opening for a receptionist and she sent her resume in and was hired immediately. She has since been promoted and now she's going back to school and is, and is a community leader. Janae says, UPO guided me through one of the most vulnerable times as a young woman and I could have been homeless and alone and that she's forever grateful to the services we've provided. These individuals reflect our corporate and policy vision. Our approach is comprehensive and we will continue to be innovative as we strive to ensure the self-sufficiency of all the residents in our city. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. This is all really incredible testimony, so I appreciate it. Um, so let's also have, I think what I wanted to, yeah. Let's have um, Mr. Aboda go ahead now before we do any questions. Great, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, good morning, Council Member Nadeau, uh, members of the members and staff of the Committee on Human Services, uh, panelists, especially uh, UPO Board Chair Mr. Page, uh, UPO CEO and President uh, Andrea, who is my partner in this work, um, and also attendees, uh, particularly our customers and uh, service partners. I am Tunde Eboda, Lead Program Officer for the Community Services Block, Block Grant here at the Family Services Administration within the DC Department of Human Services. I bring you greetings from DHS, especially from our agency director, uh, Laura Zeilinger. Thank you for the opportunity this morning. Um, I'm happy to be here to provide testimony on the district uh, community services block grant. DHS, as you know, uh, is the district agency responsible for the management, administration, and oversight of uh, CSBG operations in the district. The United Planning Organization is the designated community action agency. 
and the CSVG eligible entity that receives the sole source uh, funds uh, from CSVG and the primary partner delivering CSVG services throughout the district. They have played this historical role for approximately uh, six decades now, uh, before many of us uh, got, got into this uh, line of work. Uh, CSVG is entirely federally funded, uh, devoted to the operations of uh, the state CSVG office, direct services administered by UPO, its network of community and faith-based organizations. They have the responsibility, UPO, they have the responsibility to design and provide programs and services to alleviate causes and consequences of poverty uh, in the district. Uh, the network of organizations uh, involved with UP operations is under a contractual relationship. Uh, they deliver programs and services in all eight wards of the district. The CSVG for about two decades now uh, operates an outcome-based management and accountability system. Uh, this is a management approach that measures the impact that the programs are actually having on the lives of the people that we serve. Uh, this was developed nationally and adopted here locally, especially by UPO, uh, with due consideration to local dynamics. Uh, some of the program priority areas include employment, housing, health, education, income management, nutrition, emergency services, coordination and linkages with partners and programs across the district and income management and self-sufficiency. The UPO management and board uh, designs these programs uh, with an outcome orientation in mind. The state CSVG office has a requirement to monitor performance and compliance in this area. In fiscal year 2002, uh, to date, uh, the record shows that UPO uh, has delivered on duplicated services to over 47,000 customers. At the end of fiscal year 2021, UPO delivered in excess of 58,000 uh, deliver services to in excess of 58,000 customers. Uh, bear in mind, uh, this is under a very challenging circumstance of the uh, prevailing uh, public health emergency of uh, COVID-19. Uh, ICSVG funded. Uh, in FY 2022, the CSVG allocation to the district was a little over $12 million, of which about $11 million uh, was due to UPO. The district government receives its CSVG funding through the annual federal appropriation process. The federal agency that oversees CSVG is the US Department of Health and Human Services. The statutory 90% minimum pass through is established by the CSVG statute, as well as a maximum 5% administrative cap. DHS may not retain more than 5% of the grant uh, to administer the program. The remaining 5% uh, balance of the grant is used to support activities that are consistent with the purposes of the CSVG grant. Um, state oversight responsibilities. A unique governance structure of CSVG is that low-income people uh, participate directly in the decisions that are being made at UPO. A minimum of one-third of members of the UPO board are low-income or representatives of low-income. A second one-third of the elected uh, of, of uh, 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 public, a second one-third is comprised of uh, elected public officials or their representatives. The balance one third members of the board of UPO 
may be comprised of members of businesses, professional organizations, and members of industry in the community. The CSVG office monitors also uh, for compliance in this regard, especially the one third representatives of low income uh, people on the UPO board. Uh, those members of the low income representatives are elected uh, and must be uh, residents of the areas that they represent on the UPO board. The CSVG statute also requires that the state convene at least one legislative session every three years. Uh, one such uh, hearing is what is going on here today. The purpose of the hearing is to provide uh, a public with the opportunity to comment uh, on the use and distribution of CSVG within the state. The schedule of a comprehensive on-site monitoring exercise is also a responsibility of the state CSVG office. The statutory minimum of once every three years is in fact exceeded uh, uh, by DHS. We conduct monitoring exercises of UPO not in the same depth and breadth as the uh, uh, once every three years exercise. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we are in touch with UPO on the ground and we conduct desk uh, reviews of reports by UPO uh, yearly. And in most times, the desk reviews are con conducted uh, uh, monthly. Uh, these interactions are done in order to ensure the practice of proper management and accounting standards are being implemented at UPO. DHS in turn also undergoes its own oversight reviews by auditors and by uh, the US Department of Health and Human Services uh, when they are uh, scheduled to come out and provide uh, uh, on-site visit to the uh, state CSVG office uh, here at DHS. Uh, the last uh, UPO uh, comprehensive monitoring was done uh, uh, beginning in June of 2020, and it lasted for approximately four weeks. The most recent single audit conducted of the CSVG program within DHS was also in uh, uh, the spring of uh, 2020. Board exercises shows no material deficiencies in program operations, systems, and controls. Service delivery, particularly service delivery during the COVID uh, period. Uh, FY 2020 through FY 2022 represents an additional magnitude in obligation and expenditures due to the public health emergency. Specifically, US Department of Health and Human Services provided about $16 million to the district for the period 2020 through 2022. Uh, these additional funds assume the characteristics of the regular CSVG funds. Uh, 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 with special emphasis on addressing consequences of the increasing unemployment and economic dis disruption due to COVID-19. UPO devoted a great part of their testimony to the activities that was conducted during the uh, COVID uh, intensive period of 2020 to 2022. The CSVG retained about 5% of the COVID grant and was used uh, to supplement DHS's homeless uh, emergency rental assistance program. Uh, in the context of coordinating and delivering regular CSVG services, there are always ongoing efforts to strengthen the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, CSVG operations and reporting throughout the CSVG network. The state CSVG office has responsibility to provide technical training to UPO should they require it. They in turn have the responsibility to make sure that their partners in this work also have the capacity to deliver results uh, based on uh, contractual uh, arrangements. The CSVG office and UPO adopted organizational standards to help guide 
the work that we do. There are 58 such organizational standards. These standards operate within the statutory mandates of the CSBG and build on accountability and continuous improvement process. A performance-based grant, as a performance-based based grant, uh, CSBG standards increase the ability to measure the impact that the program is having on the lives of low-income individuals, families, and communities. This data-driven process allows UPO to confirm which strategies are working and to consult with uh, the state CSBG office on approaches to adjust methodologies to make sure that we're maximizing uh, the uh, benefits that CSBG affords. There are three components of the organizational standards. Maximum feasibility partic participation, uh, which includes involvement of customers, input from customers, community, and assessment of uh, uh, that involvement to make sure that uh, we're getting the kind of inputs that we desire. Uh, vision and direction, uh, which, which speaks to the uh, organizational leadership, board governance, and strategic planning. Operations and accountability, which speaks to financial operations and oversight, uh, data collection, analysis, and presentation. Review of the comments on the state CSVG state plan. When possible, this public oversight roundtable is designed to coincide with the development of the CSBG state plan. Notwithstanding whether that calendar dates work out or not, availability of the draft CSBG state plan is published in the DC register and made available at various sites within the district. It's usually available for public review and comments for approximately a month, about 30 days. This year, the state plan was made available beginning in June 2022 through July 5th, 2022. The locations where the state plan could be accessed were here at DHS, over at UPO, and at the Martin Luther King Jr. Library, 901 G Street Northwest. An electronic copy of the state plan was also made available at the DHS and the UPO websites. The annual CSVG state plan was due for submission this year on September 1st, 2022. The CSVG plan was uh, submitted and accepted uh, by the Federal Oversight Agency, US Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the plan and application for this period is covering FY 2023 and FY 2024. The state plan is deemed a working document. It's never a closed document. During the period 2023 and 2022, DHS and UPO at their option may decide to amend the plan to reflect demands by customers and demands by uh, conditions uh, that require that the plan be amended. Uh, that option remains open uh, throughout the duration of the two-year plan. DHS has responsibility for uh, certifications and statutory assurances uh, that have been already attested to by the director of DHS. Recommendations contained in the UPO's community needs assessment also played a role in the uh, design of the state plan. Uh, available secondary and economic data uh, in the district also played a role in the development of the state plan. In closing, DHS will continue to strive to meet the needs of low-income individuals, families, and communities in the district. The agency will continue to work and strengthen its partnership with the CSVG eligible entity, UPO, in this effort. The essential programs and services they provide are competitively selected uh, uh, to bring in uh, network participants of independent organizations uh, that participate in the uh, citywide uh, uh, reach of CSVG. 
We thank the committee this morning for the opportunity to provide a few highlights of the management and administration of CSVG program in the district. Both UPO and the state CSVG office are happy to answer questions uh, that you may have. Uh, this ends my uh, official testimony. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, this is why this is my favorite block grant. Very good. <laughs> but only nerds have favorite block grants. So here we are. <laughs> anyway, um, while I have um, some questions, I mean, all three of you were quite thorough. So I don't want to keep us too much longer, but I do want to just give you the chance with a few questions to highlight okay. a few more things. Um, so starting with our uh, UPRO partners, um, community action agencies from the start of the war on poverty were intended to involve the low income populations they serve in the planning, administration, and evaluation of their programs. How does UPO do that? Sure. As Dr. Tunde noted, one third of the board members are representatives of the low income. In addition to that, uh, we have uh, uh, surveys that go out to the community so low income members can let us know how we are providing services to them and how we might better be able to provide services to them. As we completed our community, our triannual community needs assessment, we have focus groups and forums with the community, again, for their direct input into the services that they are articulating that they need. And again, how we might be uh, best able to not just serve the community, but partner with the community, because the goal is empowerment, not just you feel coming in and saying, yeah, we're going to, to deliver this. Um, and one of the things that I believe or I know our advocacy team to do very well is to keep community residents engaged, not just in receiving supports from UPO, but also helping to deliver support. So when we talked about the delivery of um, meals to um, the community, those were low income residents taking care of their fellow residents um, during the pandemic. And going out and educating people about the census. So the core of our work is driven by the voices um, of people that we serve. Beautiful. Um, you mentioned the board um, governance structure. How, do, how are board members selected and how long do they serve? Sure. So I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeff. No, go ahead. I'll let you take it. <laughs> so our board members can serve two, three year terms. So up to six years. It is a tripartite board. Um, Congresswoman Norton is able to appoint a board member. We have a board member that uh, represents the Parent Policy Council for our early learning. Um, we have a third that are elected board members. And so uh, members in that area go out and they can campaign, campaign in the community and talk about why they should be representing um, the community across all eight wards as a board uh, member and a board representative for their ward. And then we have a third that are appointed by the board. And those members tend to um, be chosen based on an expertise that they may have. It may be law or financial or early education. And so based on the, the uh, makeup that we have of the board, when we have members who are coming off, um, like we have two attorneys that are going to be coming off soon, we know that we will uh, make sure that we have legal representation coming on the board. Very good, very good. Um, in a recent needs assessment, UPO staff identified the need for improved communication and collaboration across programs and divisions as the most pressing operational challenge facing the agency. How is UPO responding to that finding? Sure. So one of the things that we're doing is um, upgrading our um, internal intranet to the SharePoint, because we see that as one way of making sure information is shared broadly across the agency. So it isn't just a, um, a tool for handling documents, but it is a tool for making sure information um, that may be shared at the executive level is then seen widely and broadly by the entire staff. We're also making sure that as we are um, uh, uh, doing new projects, new programs within the agency, again, we're using that as a tool to send out, whether it's the flyers or um, um, uh, successes of the program, that we're using technology to our advantage for that. 
great. More than half of American youth experienced emotional abuse at home in 2021. One third were in a household where someone lost a job, and more than a third reported experiencing poor mental health during the pandemic. The New York Times reported that the pandemic wiped out two decades of improvement in math and reading scores in nine-year-olds. So how does UPO's early education and youth services division respond to the challenges of the pandemic? I guess we kind of went into this. <laughs> Mr. Page did talked a lot about this. Um, but, you know, just if you could highlight the mental health piece sure. and the learning piece, just again, that would be great. Sure. So as it related to mental health, one of the things that we did was partner because we understood um, that they're not just the stress on the young people, but the stress on the adults in the household. So they're stressed and being able to provide the sorts of supports their young people that they would need would be difficult. And so that's why we partnered with mental health providers to allow for both family and one-on-one -on -one sessions with them so that people could deal with whatever anxieties that they were having around um, just the pandemic. So it's the regular poverty stressors and then the pandemic on top of that. So we knew that would be important. We also partnered with and granted other um, uh, nonprofits to get young people out of the house. And we understood that if they could do things around sports or um, uh, just being with other teenagers in a socially distanced and safe way, that that was a way to um, mitigate some of those mental health challenges of just being enclosed. And that was why we felt it was so important to also um, provide money to families for summer camps that students could have this opportunity to get away. And quite frankly, parents could get the breather that some of them needed because they had been in the home um, educating their child, going through the pandemic stressors. And we saw this is twofold. So yes, we were um, supporting young people having this opportunity to go some to away summer camps or some locally, but parents then got that time that they needed to decompress and receive some of the supports they need. And even prior to this, we were working with some of our communities that told us uh, directly that there were issues around domestic abuse. And so we did work with domestic abuse professionals to come directly in and work with um, families or work with um, uh, uh, apartment buildings that we were uh, had services because when the when the residents say to us this is something that we're all talking about that is a, a huge light bulb um, that that's something that is pervasive and we knew we needed to come alongside them and to provide some support uh, for them and then as it relates to um, the learning loss that we were very concerned about again making sure that we were working with partners um, to support them in, in engaging with young people. But even as we um, went through the pandemic, we were sending um, science kits to the young people so that they would have that in their homes to continue on with their STEM-based learning and doing that virtually with their teachers. And then we implemented the Epic Book Club, which uh, we actually hired um, DCPS teachers to work after school with uh, reading enrichments for young people. I would also like to add um, a few other things. And I would um, like to also give Andrea a, a lot of credit because mental health has been something that she has been advocating for um, since the beginning of her tenure as president and CEO. It's something that she has really been driving home. Um, and in two instances um, where the things she talked about regarding mental health, and then there's also when we had our virtual MLK Summit, um, she, we had a mental health panel and we walked through all the challenges associated with mental health in the pandemic. And then the other thing that I wanted to highlight is, um, again, it goes back to us being responsive and adaptable. You know, one of the things that parents had expressed during the pandemic were, was um, they were uneasy about going on public transportation and the Metro and um, to utilize the, the services we provided. So what we did was we used our vans to pick people up, to deliver the goods. And to me that, you know, when we think about policy, we tend to think about it on a very macro level, 
but it's those little micro things that make a difference. And what we did was to use existing tools in our warehouse to address a, a real need in the community. So those are just the little things that I think we, I would like to think that we have done to try to ease some of the anxiety around, you know, you know, as Andrea said, poverty is stressful and hard, but poverty during the pandemic, you know, when we all experienced the stress of what, what it was to be in living in the pandemic. And so I, that to me is an example of how we, again, try to be adaptable, try to be nimble and try to be responsive to the needs. And I just really want to, again, give Ms. Thomas her credit for really, really being a strong mental health advocate. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you. Um, for Dr. Imoda, um, can you share how or if the CARES Act affected the size of the district's CSBG allocation and how any additional funds were used? Yes, um, <clears throat> significantly, uh, uh, because an infusion of an additional uh, $16 million over three years, uh, assuming the characteristics of the regular CSVG, meaning the distribution has to be a minimum 90% going out to direct services at UPO. Uh, the balance of the grant, uh, which is about $821,000, uh, was used to supplement the uh, uh, emergency rental assistance program. Uh, the uh, administrative portion of it, <clears throat> uh, we're very small shop, uh, about five FTEs, uh, uh, four field positions and one recent vacancy. So we augmented our staff during COVID with the um, our CARES Act funds by uh, engaging in a contractual relationship with the personnel uh, services uh, uh, company here in DC. Uh, to, to get uh, two uh, additional grants management uh, uh, staff uh, uh, for that period. Um, uh, so their tenure is going to end uh, uh, when all of the reporting for CARES Act is, is finished. That's in about six months from now. Uh, so, and then the balance of the administrative funds uh, was also used uh, uh, as a part of the pass through to uh, direct services at UPO. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Um, now, in May of this year, the US House of Representatives passed the bipartisan CSBG Modernization Act. So that legislation is going to, it'll reauthorize the program for 10 years, right. add a, mil a billion in appropriations for the first five of those. 10 years and allow states to use CSBG funding to provide services to individuals earning up to 200% of the federal poverty line as was right. temporarily provided for in the CARES Act. Now, right. how is DHS planning for both the possibility of that bill's passage and the possibility that CSBG client eligibility might once again be restricted to 100% of poverty? Right. So we'll, we'll own our part of it, but the responsibility begins with the federal uh, uh, authorities. Uh, when legislation comes through, uh, there has to be guidance that is provided by the Federal Oversight Office. So we will wait to receive uh, the guidance that comes from uh, HHS on what is gonna change and what's gonna stay the same. Uh, we expect fully that now that we've had a pilot period to test out, the uh, eligibility criteria at about 200% of poverty, uh, that that data uh, will influence the decision that uh, 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 the statutory authorities are gonna make on whether to keep the old 125% uh, uh, of poverty, which leaves out quite a lot of our customer base. Uh, uh, there are folk that are working but still struggling to make ends meet and can benefit uh, substantially from the services that uh, UPO and CSVG provides. So we fully expect that 200% uh, percent of poverty will be retained now that we've had data to support the fact that uh, 
uh, the population uh, needing support uh, needs to be expanded. But to summarize, uh, the guardians from HHS will determine how the states around the country uh, react to the changes that may uh, uh, come uh, by way of the uh, new uh, uh, CSBG uh, legislation. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Bode, is there anything else you want to add? Well, um, regarding, regarding the uh, uh, Regarding the services that that UPO provides, they couldn't they couldn't do this without without the support of uh, uh, legislative uh, leaders in the in the in the district. Uh, they couldn't do it without a very strong uh, uh, board, uh, an engaged uh, board. Uh, when I go to uh, training conferences. Uh, I realize how fortunate we are here in the district. Uh, we don't always sit around the table and uh, uh, play kumbaya, uh, but uh, we do work well together. And that's a testament to the leadership of UPO, a testament to the leadership of DHS. Uh, the culture that is created is one of solving problems together. So we're sitting around the table and designing approaches that uh, uh, make sure that uh, 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 we're focused on what we think works best for our customers. Uh, with that in mind, we can set aside uh, uh, any challenges that uh, uh, may be artificial and focus on the needs of our, our customers. So the credit goes to our leaders, the credit goes to our customers who themselves inform and demand uh, the level of uh, participation uh, and engagement that they want from us. Uh, so with the customers driving that, with the leadership making demands that we always uh, 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 lead by excellence, uh, uh, the job becomes, becomes, the job then drives itself. Uh, some of us that have done this a while uh, also draw on the experience of things uh, that we know not to do. Uh, you do them, you get in trouble. If we wanted to do compliance all the time, we can do that all day long and not do anything else. But we have to balance compliance when we go out to do monitoring. Uh, we go there, we spend a minimum one week on the ground. We can trash around and uh, beat UPO over the head with uh, uh, details about stuff. But really what matters is uh, uh, the engagement that they have with low-income people. Uh, we see the results are there, the stories are there, the data is there. We tell our stories with numbers. The numbers support the work that UPO is doing, and we're happy to have uh, uh, them as partners. I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So with that, this will conclude today's public uh, oversight roundtable. And if you plan on submitting written testimony for the record, I ask that you do so by emailing it to humanservices at dccouncil.us by close of business on Thursday, September 29th. With that, Thank you, Chairman Nadeau. Yeah, the time is 11.34 a.m. and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Sure. Thank you.